Encounter is brought to you by the Broome County Council of Churches, where we connect compassion with needs as we inspire growth with dignity. You'll find us in special places throughout the community. For those who remain hungry, we provide meals. For those who are challenged, we build wheelchair ramps. We comfort those who are ill, minister to those who are confined, and we remain an advocate for change and understanding on behalf of every element of our community. Connect and inspire. Encounter the Broome County Council of Churches. Good morning, I'm Jeff Kellum, your host today on Encounter. Today, uh, we have a couple of guests with us who have come uh, from Kansas uh, via Ethiopia and the South Sudan. They are Presbyterian missionaries and their story is one of uh, being ab abducted and being shot, uh, but, but also helping to teach the lessons of forgiveness and reconciliation uh, in, a, in a unique and wonderful way, a miraculous way. Also, um, leaving behind in Ethiopia a legacy of uh, clinics and schools and uh, roads, uh, churches, uh, a long time uh, missionary presence there. So let me introduce you to John and Gwen Haspels. Um, and you are both uh, Presbyterian missionaries. Who knew Presbyterians had missionaries? Uh, <laughs> it's, I guess it's not one of those things that we are well known for, but I know that you come from long time missionary families. Uh, Gwen, you were born where? In the South Sudan. In the South Sudan. Mm -hmm. And tell me uh, about your missionary, uh, what, grandparents? Yes, my grandfather and grandmother were missionaries and my father then was born there and went back with my mom and all four of us children grew up there and then John and I went back again. Right, and, uh, and John, what about your, your background? Well, my dad was in seminary at, uh, Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh and right after seminary, they went as missionaries to Ethiopia and I was only six months old at the time. Uh. So we went on an old troop carrier right after the war, yeah. where the women had one big dormitory on the, on the ship and the men had one big dormitory on the ship. But I got to go into the women's section because I was only six months Real old. old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. And so you uh, and your children have been born in Ethiopia? Well, we have one son that was born in Dembidolo and some churches here in this community have a relationship with Dembidolo. Yes. Uh, he is now a missionary in Kenya with his wife and family. And then we have uh, one daughter that was born in Nairobi, and she is now a missionary in Ethiopia with her husband, who is right. an Ethiopian, and that's where they work. And then we have two of our children here in the States. Right. And one of whom is working in mission work, too, uh, mm -hmm. in, in another, another area. So. Um, but you do have Kansas roots. I mentioned that. Gwen, tell me about yeah. the, the roots in Kansas. Well, the first that I ever knew of Kansas, my parents came on furlough and we spent a year ah. in uh, Sterling, Kansas, because they had gone to college there. Right. And then when we got ready to go to college, we automatically went there, and that's where we started. Yeah. being Kansans. Right, <laughs> so you both went to Sterling College, mm -hmm. uh, a Presbyterian school, mm -hmm. and then you were married in 1970, so I've done some research. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, but you spent most of your life in, uh, in Ethiopia. Right. Now, uh, tell me about, before we get to the dramatic story of being uh, uh, shot, uh, and, and before that, being abducted and held for ransom, mm -hmm. Tell me about the work of, of 20th or 21st century missionaries in terms of, of the development of the people uh, in, in, in Ethiopia specifically. Yeah, at the time we went to Ethiopia, the, the uh, government of Emperor Haile Selassie was overthrown by a Marxist revolution. And so initially when we went to Ethiopia, we were accused of being CIA, whatnot, yeah. And so we were eventually forced out of Ethiopia in 1977. And, th and that's when a severe persecution came against the church in Ethiopia. Um, we then went across the border since we were kicked out of Ethiopia to South Sudan uh, to do development work with an organization known as ACROSS. Mm -hmm. 
And it was while we were doing that development work, and that work involved drilling wells and putting up windmills. Mm. Uh, it was then that this rebel group came in and took us hostage for a short time. Uh, and, and the rebel group was taking you hostage in order to keep you from doing your work or in order to get money for you? Well, interestingly, uh, there had been a mutiny of some soldiers to the west of us, and the government had started a bombing campaign, and a MiG-19 showed up one day out of fuel, and the pilot just managed to land this MiG-19 on an airstrip uh, at the base of the mountain where we were working. And that's what really started the whole ordeal. The rebels actually came in to, to destroy the MiG. Yeah. Unfortunately for them, the government had lengthened the airstrip and brought in fuel, and the, they were able to take the MiG out on a Wednesday, and the rebels arrived on a Thursday morning and took us hostage. Right. Yeah. So that must have been a frightening experience. No one uh, ever thinks you're going to be taken, kidnapped, and, and held for, for ransom. How, how, now, Gwen, you were released early. Yes, with I your was, children. With the children, and uh, and the sick, uh, one of the zoologists from the uh, camp down below us. And so we flew out. And the hardest part was really not knowing what was happening to John. I and the kids were okay. Yeah. And and we could talk to him on the radio every day but you don't know what's going on until sure. later I didn't realize all the things he went through. But. Yeah. And then you, uh, your anxiety about your wife and children uh, was, I guess, uh, somewhat lessened because you were able to talk to them by phone, but you still must have been... Well, we couldn't. I had no communications with her afterwards, oh, after okay. she left. Okay. But she was able to hear on the other end. Oh. The first thing the rebels did was take away our two-way radio, so sure. all communications was cut off. Yeah. But because they made some demands, uh, hostage demands, they would bring the radio to our house every day and, and have me transmit out oh, whether okay. their demands okay. were going to be met or not. Man. So she was on the other end, and she could hear these if yeah, she wanted to. I knew to. that he was still alive by then. Yeah, well, that would be helpful, wouldn't yes. it? Well, so uh, how long were you in, in captivity? It was only two weeks. So uh, in terms of hostage ordeals, it was a rather short one. Yeah, uh, but nonetheless, uh, anxiety producing. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so at that point, you gave up being missionaries and flew home, and that was the end of the story. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm being facetious because I know that's not the end of the that story. That sort of happened, you know. We did have to leave the area and yeah. it stopped our outreach to this particular tribe in southern Sudan. And at that time then we went to the presbytery in southern Kansas and said, look, we're going to take a leave of absence for a short time. Yes. Are there any empty churches? And so we pastored a church there in Kansas for two years and then went back to yeah. uh, Ethiopia. Yeah. So what year was the abduction? That was 1983. So that's 1983, and then in, uh, well, 20 years later, mm -hmm. you are still working in Ethiopia. You have, you built a road, um, among other things. You, you described um, just kind of driving the bulldozers through the... Through the bush. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it wasn't a road with gutters and paving, <laughs> but it was a, a, a crude road that at least accomplished... Yeah. Uh, the, the biggest obstacle we faced, interestingly, was bees. Bees, wild bees in, yeah. in the forest, you know, would be agitated by the sound of the bulldozer and the smell of smoke and diesel. Sure. Yeah. And they, a, a number of times, attacked the bulldozer and the operator sitting in the open. And then <laughs> on one occasion, yeah. he just jumped off, left the bulldozer running, and yeah. had to take cover. <laughs> yeah, I think I would have, I would have joined him. Yeah. Well, so 20 years later, um, you had this other thing that was even more dramatic, uh, which was driving along a road and encountering a gunman who came out of the bush. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I guess, just tell me the story. Uh, either one of you can, can recount this. Um, you want to start? No, you go it's, ahead. It's a, uh, well, at the time we were building a house for a Wycliffe Bible translator. And while we were building the house, we ran out of roofing nails. So I said, oh, I'll go back and get some roofing nails. And I took Gwen with me. 
And on our way back with the roofing nails to complete the house for the Wycliffe Bible translator, uh, a man came to us just as we were leaving and said, can you make a diversion in your trip and go to such and such a place so I can catch a bus? Yeah. Which would have been a half an hour diversion for us. And we agreed to do that. And it was into that diversion just after crossing a, a river valley, which in Ethiopian or Amharic is known as Chalama Shet, which means valley of darkness. Mm. We crossed that valley. Yeah. And uh, the thing that reminds us every time we cross that valley is Psalm 23, where it says, if you go through the valley of the shadow, shadow of death, death, I'll be with you. Yes. So we had that knowledge, that comfort all the time that God was with us, no matter what the valley was. Yeah. Well, within a mile of that valley, we rounded a corner and a man with an AK-47 jumped out of the bush trying to stop the car. He didn't know it was us because I was driving a different car. Had you been driving the... We had another car. A recognizable car, he probably yeah. wouldn't have attacked you. He thought, I'm sure that we were tourists. Yeah. And so he was intent on robbery. Uh, I was going as fast as I could on that road, which was about 23 miles an hour, <laughs> but I couldn't stop. Yeah. And as we passed him, he had jumped into the ditch. Uh, we were both looking at him in the ditch, pointing his gun at us. Yeah. And I was waving my finger at him, don't you dare. And it was at that point that he shot. Oh. Fortunately, the window of the car was open, so we didn't have glass, glass shattering all through yeah. the, the car. The, car. the bullet came through the window, caught my wife just below the nose, and took out bone and teeth, about 20 teeth she lost in her mouth, which you can guess it just uh, blew her face, half her face off. Yeah. Uh, the bullet came on through, hit me in my collarbone bone, and broke the collarbone, but ricocheted up through the roof of the oh car. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but the real damage to me was her teeth. <laughs> you know, 20 teeth coming out, my hand was right in front of her jaw, so I had... Yeah teeth marks all across my arm. I had one tooth that hit me here on the jaw, and my dentist tells me it's still there. My gosh. You can see it right there. Oh, my. Another tooth hit me right in the middle of the forehead, yeah. and chips of fillings and whatnot went into this eye and blinded this eye. Wow. So. What, I, I just can't imagine, uh, of course, it, it happens in an instant. Yeah. You're looking <laughs> over at the man in the, in the, gutter there, wherever, and you're looking, uh, the gun is pointed at you, and you probably didn't really think he was going to shoot, or did you? We didn't. So, so then he shoots. Now, you're both covered in blood, and you're, was anyone else with you in the car? Yeah, we had uh, four other people in the car. Oh, my. And so, and, but they were unhurt. They were unhurt. Two of them bailed out immediately. Yeah. They thought we were all going to die, so they, for survival reasons, just jumped sure, out of sure. the moving vehicle. It's a natural, <laughs> natural thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and then you drove yourselves. Uh, you can't see very well. You've got one eye blinded. The other one is covered in blood. Right. And so uh, you're weaving back and forth down this already primitive road, I guess. So you find help. You wind up going to South Africa, right, for right. for the medical attention that you needed. Mm -hmm. Um, Gwen, talk about going to the hospital at, well, or the, the clinic, wherever it was you first went. Yeah. The first clinic was maybe half an hour away, and I had covered my face with my scarf to try and stop the bleeding. And so when we walked in, even though we're covered in blood, the nurse looks at us and says, what are you doing here? So all I did was take the scarf off my yeah. face, and they could see that it was a mess. Yeah. Well, they hopped to and got things going. I said, I need an IV, first of all. Yeah. And then they stitched John up, yeah. and they couldn't stitch me at all. They just covered it over and, and tied it up, and then they sent us on to the next right. hospital. So, and then you wound up in, in South Africa, and, and several surgeries later, you still face some more reconstructive surgery. Yes. Now, this is a powerful uh, uh, event, but it leads to a powerful story of, of forgiveness. So what next? Tell, uh, in fact, right after the shooting, you reminded John, reminded you or you reminded John of a, of a prayer uh, 
kind of agreement or covenant you had with your children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Describe that. Well, my daughters and I have two daughters, and then I have an Ethiopian daughter, and we had all agreed that for October, we were not going to do any asking prayers. We were just going to praise God and thank Him. So it's a whole month of, of just praising God. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as this happened, my husband said to me, uh, do you remember your covenant with your daughters? And I nodded my head. So he said, well, we need to thank God for this. Yeah. So he said, thank you, Lord, for 65 good years of use of my eye. And I said, you're 67, you're not 65. <laughs> so you lost two years, right? Well, yeah. Two years of not praising God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then we were able to thank God and to praise Him. You don't have to wait for something good to happen to really praise God. You can praise Him in the hard things because He's worthy of praise all the time. Yeah, yeah. He's not just worthy when He's good to us. He's worthy all the time. So you are certainly thankful that you were you survived this attack, um, but you also talked about the the miracles involved. You listed well, two or three miracles. That, that morning we were studying with the people there in the book of uh, Acts, chapter seven, and at the end of that chapter, Stephen is stoned. Mm -hmm. And I like to ask the question: What does Stephen say as he's being brutally killed yeah. with rocks? Yeah. He said, don't hold this into their charge. Essentially, Stephen forgave all the people that were stoning.